Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any uh, members of the committee who are using electronic devices to access their committee papers should please ensure that they're switched to silent. We have received apologies today from Tavish Scott, MSP. Uh, the first item of business uh, on the agenda today is consideration of the Census Amendment Scotland Bill at stage two, and I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop and her officials. Uh, first, we shall call Amendment one in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments two, three and four, and the Cabinet Secretary is to move Amendment one and speak to all other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'll speak to Amendment 1 and the other amendments in this group. Uh, in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report and during the Stage 1 debate uh, on the Bill in Parliament on the 28th of February, I committed to bring forward these amendments to address the issue of the perceived conflation of sex and gender identity in the Bill as introduced. The amendments that I have lodged are to deal with this issue, which the Committee highlighted. The committee in its report supported a proposal by the Equality Network to amend the bill, and as I previously confirmed, our thinking on this was not very different on that approach. I undertook to make sure that my officials engaged with stakeholders in developing the amendments, and I can confirm to the committee that National Records of Scotland worked with the Equality Network and others on the specific text of these amendments before they were lodged. And National Records of Scotland also wrote to other interested stakeholders, including the women's groups that responded to the committee's call for evidence at stage one, to highlight highlight the suggested amendments and to seek any views they had on them. No issues were raised by any of these stakeholders, only support. And as the committee will know, I lodged these amendments much earlier than is usual, in fact, before Easter recess, to give the committee and others as much uh, notice of them as possible. The amendments presented to you would place transgender matters into Schedule 1 of the 1920 Act as an entry on its own alongside religion and sexual orientation and would remove the provision in the bill which would have added including gender identity to the paragraph in that schedule which contains the word sex. The amendments would also continue to ensure that the census order will be able to make the question on transgender status and history voluntary, which is one of the key purposes of the bill. I'm pleased that stakeholders, the committee and parliament have supported the general principles of the census bill, and it's vital that nobody is or feels in any way compelled to answer the proposed questions on transgender status and history and on sexual orientation. It is right that these questions should be voluntary. It is also critical that all respondents clearly know that voluntary means that there will be no penalty by not answering these questions, and work is in hand by National Records of Scotland to ensure that, that is achieved. To conclude, the amendments being proposed deal with the issues raised by the committee on the perceived conflation of sex and gender identity and are supported by the stakeholders consulted as I set out earlier. And importantly, Amendment 4 now puts transgender status and history explicitly in the long title of the bill. That is why I'm pleased to have been able to bring forward these amendments and I move Amendment 1. Thank you very much. Would other members wish to comment? Claire Baker, MSP. Um, thank you. It's um, just to say that the, the amendments are very welcome. I think they do reflect the wider debate that was held by the committee and they do in my view, provide the necessary clarity to this short bill. Um, and so we'll be supporting the amendments and I'm pleased to see them here this morning. Annabel Ewing. <coughs> yes, I would echo what Claire Baker has said. Um, we did, in fact, call for the Cabinet Secretary to do the very thing that she has now come to the committee and explain she has done. So I think that is very welcome. And, and as Claire said, it does provide the clarity that the committee was seeking. Thank you. If no other members wish to contribute, um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Uh, just finally to say that these amendments, if approved, will actually allow the focus of the bill to be achieved. And there's currently limited uh, evidence on the experiences of transgender people in Scotland and currently no fully tested question with which to collect the information. Um, whilst the bill does not determine the text of the questions to be asked, it's paving the way for them and allowing them to be voluntary. Um, and the census would be taking a leading role to gather the evidence needed to provide uh, support and protection for Scotland's transgender population. And the proposed voluntary question on sexual orientation would mirror that already asked in most other Scottish surveys. Thank you. Can I ask you to formally move Amendment 1, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, I, I did, but I'll do that again. <laughs> formally move Amendment 1. Okay. Um, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
I'd like to now call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Uh, formally moved, Amendment 2. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I now like to call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary, can you move formally? Uh, formally moved, Amendment 3. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is now that Section 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I'd now like to call on Amendment 5 in the name of Jamie Green, MSP, in a group on its own. Jamie Green, can you move and speak to Amendment 5, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I move the amendment in my name from the outset and speak to uh, uh, amend uh, is it just Amendment 5 or Amendment 6 as well? Just, it's in a group on its own, so... Thank you. Uh, amendment 5. Uh, can I, first of all, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, uh, comments on the previous uh, amendments? I think they very much address uh, many of the issues uh, that the committee and many stakeholders uh, raised with the, the, the government, and I think they're very welcome changes. Uh, however, they do, uh, on a practical level, simply uh, make wording changes in replacing gender identity with transgender status in history. Uh, the purpose of uh, my amendments, when I spoke to the legislation team, were, were really twofold to address two, two concerns. One was uh, to uh, make it explicit uh, in the bill uh, that the questions around what was then gender identity uh, would absolutely be voluntary uh, and there would be no conflation between uh, the changes between uh, which questions were statutory and which were voluntary and I think that uh, makes that clear in 2BA. Uh, but secondly to address the issue around guidance and we took a lot of evidence I think uh, around perhaps some of the confusion over the previous census versus the new census. Now whilst I respect that we don't know what the questions will be, we don't know what the wording of the questions uh, will be, and that's yet to be discussed and tested, I think rightfully so. Um, I think regardless of what the final outcome of that is, I felt it uh, important that we uh, ensure that there is explicit guidance given to completers of the census, that it is uh, clear to them which particulars are required, and indeed it doesn't say it's specifically the amendment, but I would hope would give guidance on how people should answer those questions. And this, I guess, arose from the a previous uh, debate we had around conflation of, of, of sex and gender identity, but also to make it clear that uh, neglecting to provide those particulars in the census would not make someone liable to a penalty. So I'm hoping it's not a, a, a contentious amendment, Amendment 5. Uh, what I seek to do is uh, make to ensure that guidance is clear, given that there is a substantial change from how people uh, to whom this change affects previously answered the census to how they may now answer it and I hope that that guidance will be robust and that it is clear to them that if they choose not to answer that inf uh, information that there's no uh, penalty uh, thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call the Cabinet Secretary, would any other members like to contribute? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, sorry, Claire Baker. No, I was going to ask if um, if Jimmy Green's had any discussions with the bill team. My understanding is the guidance, there is always guidance published. I suppose we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary whether it would include what you're proposing to include. It might just be that it's a double way of achieving what is already there. And also a question which you might not be able to answer the Cabinet Secretary might is my understanding is that in previous censuses where the um, question was voluntary, it was stated within the document that you're completing that this question is voluntary. That would seem to be the clearest way to make it um, clear to people that the question is voluntary rather than having to look up the guidance to find that information. Um, uh, if they could confirm that it will be stated as it was in 2011, it will also be stated next to the actual question rather than maybe in notes at the beginning, it will be quite clear that that question is voluntary. Which I think is what Jamie is trying to achieve to make it clear to people who are completely informed that it's voluntary. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green. That, uh, thank you to Claire Baker for that question. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, the difference from the new census to the previous one, though, is that I think uh, people uh, were answering the sex question uh, in terms of their lived sex, uh, and I think if you are asking additional questions, um, I, all I would like to see is to ensure that the, the guidance given makes it clear to people completing uh, the 
new census in whichever wording it eventually ends, uh, that they understand fully how they should answer that question if there is a, a change. And, I, and, and some of the feedback I got from meeting stakeholders was that there may have been confusion perhaps under the previous wording of sex and gender identity. So I think perhaps some of the earlier amendments may tidy that up uh, and make it uh, more obvious. I, 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 there is guidance which comes with the census um, uh, already, but I, I, I just want to make it clear that uh, that, that guidance is, is robust and explicit in terms of how people should complete new additional questions and, of course, that they don't feel pressured that they have to complete any additional questions that the government has put on a new census. Any other members want to come in? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and also thank you to Jimmy Green for highlighting this important issue. Indeed, it reflects the main policy driver for this bill, which is to make these sensitive questions voluntary. Uh, no one should think that they are answering these questions under the threat of criminal, criminal penalty, and we've made it very clear from the beginning um, that these questions... Uh, uh, we've made it very clear from the beginning of the process that the purpose of the bill actually is to remove the, the uh, criminal penalty from these questions and make them voluntary rather than compulsory. And it's for this reason that I agree with the principles of the amendment. However, it's very important to, that we are explicitly clear to census respondents which questions are voluntary. I would also say that it will be clear before the actual census about which questions are voluntary. And that will be set out in the census order in advance and it will may, be made even clearer in the census regulations which questions are, are to be voluntary. Um, however, I, I actually don't think the amendment is necessary. Uh, Jamie Green's amendment would place the information on whether or not a question is voluntary in instructions separate from the form. Um, National Records of Scotland have been developing plans for some time to embed the words voluntary into the text of the new questions so that census respondents are not required to cross-refer cross -refer to separate instructions to find this information out. Um, this is what was done with the religion question in the 2011 11 census. Um, there is also scope, um, and I think that's the point Claire Baker is making, uh, for the addition of similar uh, direct, uh, clear direction in the covering message from the Register General, which will appear on the front page of the census questionnaire, including making it clear that there will be no liability for a penalty if voluntary questions are not completed. Uh, the information uh, will also be covered within the supporting online guidance, which I think Jimmy Green is referring to, being developed for each question. It will be made clear in this guidance, again, that these questions are voluntary and therefore refusal or neglecting to state particulars does not make a person liable to a penalty under Section 8.1. As you can see, there are already a, a number of ways in which National Records of Scotland plan to ensure that there is a clear message about the voluntary nature of these uh, questions and that it's communicated to census respondents. And actually on that basis, um, I don't consider the amendment lodged by Jamie Green to be necessary, although I do support the principles of what he's trying to achieve. So therefore, I will request that the Register General, uh, Paul Lowe, writes to Jamie Green and copy in the committee to provide these necessary reassurance on the approach that NRS will be taking to achieve this. And I hope um, I provided Jamie Green and the committee um, with enough information to provide uh, reassurance that National Records of Scotland are alive to the issue raised by his amendment and indeed is the driving purpose of this bill and that National Records of Scotland's plans actually go further to communicate this message than the provisions that he's suggesting. Um, so on that basis, I, I would ask Jamie Green uh, not to press uh, the amendment. Thank you. Jamie Green, would you like to wind up? Uh, just very briefly, uh, can I thank the current Secretary for his comments and reassurances? Uh, I think, uh, naturally, I wouldn't want my amendment to have any unintended consequences with respect to the, what is printed either on, on the guidance or on the face of the, the census itself. Um, I think those reassurances are very welcome. I think they address the issues that were the premise of the uh, amendment and therefore I would not move the amendment when it comes to it. Does any member object to Jamie Green withdrawing his amendment? No. Okay. okay. I'd now like to call Amendment 6, also in the name of Jamie Green, in a group on its own. Jamie Green, would you like to move and speak to Amendment 6? Thank you, Convener. Uh, may I move Amendment 6 my name? Uh, the general purpose of this really is, I think given, I think this whole Census Bill has, has uh, opened up a, a very wide-ranging social discussion around uh, uh, gender identity issues in, in Scotland. 
Um, and I think, given that at this stage we don't know, as I said in the previous amendment, what the final look and feel of those questions will be, uh, I, with the, again, with the kind assistance of the legislation team, who I thank, uh, drafted this amendment that we uh, review the uh, potential uh, outcomes of the next census. And I think by that uh, I mean uh, a number of things. One is that there is a duty to come back and take a stock check of the success or otherwise of these new additional voluntary questions around transgender status and sexual orientation. And I think the purpose of that really is, is to look at a number of things. One is, were they the right questions? Uh, were they worded properly or adequately in a way that elicited the best response rates? Did the addition of these questions alter the response rates of the census in any way? Uh, uh, we spoke as a committee around uh, a need that the primary core of the census is to ensure a maximum uh, response and that no additional questions should affect that in any way. And also generic feedback from users of the census to whom that section perhaps was relevant as to whether uh, they felt it adequately reflected uh, their needs. Now, I appreciate that between now and, and, and the next stage of proceedings, the, these questions and wording will go through a, a tremendous amount of testing and focus, and I think that's very welcome. Um, but I still think it would be helpful if, uh, after the next census takes place, uh, we do some uh, analysis as to whether the implications of the changes that we make uh, affect the overall undertaking of the census and indeed make any recommendations for future changes to census, i.e. the addition of new questions, which could be uh, changes to the questions that we're adding now, but indeed any other uh, sections that we choose to add as society changes and we feel it important that government wants more and additional voluntary information from, from people in general. So again, it's not, it's not the intention of it is not to be uh, difficult in any way or to place undue post-legislative scrutiny on the government, but I think given uh, the perhaps on occasions controversy of, of this, these additional questions, um, I think it would be helpful to both users of the census and to government to take a look back and decide if they feel comfortable that the questions that were added uh, meet the needs of uh, the data collection that public services require. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, before I move to the Cabinet Secretary, do any other members wish to contribute? Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, this question that I'd hope Jamie Green and the Cabinet Secretary would, would both be able to address. I don't think any of us disagree with the, <clears throat> the need for a review after the next census, but my understanding of this amendment is that, um, and this may simply be a matter of scope in relation to the bill, it would only cover a review of the questions that are changed here, i.e. around sexual orientation and uh, trans status and history. There may be further changes to the next census, depending on what is in the census order. Would it not make more sense if any review of the next census were to cover any changes made within it uh, and therefore go beyond the scope of what's in this amendment? Jamie Green. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, Ross Gere raises a, a good point. Um, I think his suggestion would be helpful. Um, the, the, as, as he rightfully pointed out, the problem with uh, Section 2A of the amendment says that it must consider the implication of the changes of the census arising out of this Act. Uh, which specifically relates to the uh, changes that we are making in this Act. I, I, my understanding was that, uh, from my discussion with the legislation team, is that I, uh, that I, could, I, I could only do that. Um, I think widening it to future changes that, that may be made to the next census would indeed be helpful. Um, I think that's maybe a, a, a technical issue that uh, we could address perhaps uh, later on. Um, I, if I could if I could change and widen that, that section, I'd be very happy to, um, and that, that may uh, address the issues. Uh, I wouldn't want to limit it to just that, but I think it's a good starting point. And uh, if, if there was opportunity, perhaps, at the next stage of uh, passing the legislation, then if there was the technical ability to widen it, I would be happy to do so. Um, but that's perhaps something I might, may need to take guidance on. Thank you. Annabelle Ewing. Yes. Just, um, I mean, I, I appreciate that what we're all trying to do is ensure that we're getting it right and that it's doing the job it's supposed to do. But just in terms of, you know, these are official statistics. So would it be for Scottish ministers to do this or would it be for the Register General 
rather to do this. And I think he does complete a report. So uh, just in terms of the process, I'm not quite clear if this is the best route. I would have thought it would be for the Register General to, to widen the report as necessary. Jamie Green. Uh, as it's currently drafted, it says the Scottish Ministers must prepare a report on ma matters mentioned uh, and lay that report before the Scottish Parliament. Now, the, as, as Ministers, uh, I'm sure with the wide range of uh, assistance they have from their respective directorates, uh, they may choose to uh, employ the assistance of the Registrar General, but the duty is on the Ministers rather than on the Registrar General, and that's the advice that I, I took as the best way to ensure that Parliament receives that report. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Um, I do appreciate the amendment coming forward and and what the the intent behind the amendment is. However, uh, we did have a wide range of discussion around the census amendment bill, but I, I'm not convinced that the two areas that you're focusing on, the voluntary questions, was really where the controversy or the debate lay within the committee. Um, and I do have some concern that while you are limited by this bill to have to focus on those two, that why there's a specific report attached to those two questions where there won't be reports unless it's the overall report. There won't be anything specific attached to any other changes. I'm not convinced whether you need to single out these two questions to be different from other ones. I don't think this is where the issues that we discussed around the bill really lay. Jamie Green, do you want to come I in on that? Just one, yes. I, I, I think that's similar to Ross Greer's feedback. Um, again, I it was of the impression that I could only uh, request uh, a, a report to be laid in specific relation to the changes that this Act makes as opposed to future Acts which are n not yet uh, laid before us. So um, I, I agree actually, I think it would be helpful to have a, a, a much wider uh, review of the, the next census and, and report that back to Parliament. Uh, but in relation to the bill that we have in front of us, that's about as far as I could take it. So um, I'm sympathetic to the to the notion that we could uh, request a, a, a wider review post the next census that give feedback on any changes that is made to the census and the success or otherwise of those changes. Any other members wish to come in? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, convener, and I understand the, the rationale behind this amendment and agree with the proposal that there should be evaluation on the important changes to the census arising out of this bill. Um, but I would like to highlight that Section 4 of the Census Act 1920 already obliges the Registrar-General to prepare reports on the census returns and lays these before Parliament. Uh, these uh, reports provide information on the data gathered in the census. And in addition, National Records of Scotland um, are already developing plans for an overall report um, on the census operation, as was the case following the 2011 uh, census, covering a range of matters, including all the new questions. The implications arising from this bill would be part of that. Unfortunately, there are some important issues that mean I can't support the amendment. Uh, the way the amendment is drafted places a one-off obligation on Scottish ministers to report on the implications of the changes to the census brought about by this bill, and I'll come back to that later. Um, firstly, this amendment focuses on the new voluntary questions, sexual orientation and transgender status, and would not uh, encompass other new questions, for example, such as the veterans' questions, and National Records of Scotland are planning to report on all of the new questions in the 2021 census, not just the new questions made voluntary by this bill. And I think that's a point made by Ross Greer and Claire Baker. But to be fair to Jimmy Green, obviously you had to deal with what's in the scope of this bill and the purpose of this bill is just about the voluntary questions and just to make sure that they're not, uh, there's no criminal penalty. Um, secondly, um, and importantly, Jamie Green's amendment would place this obligation to report on the Scottish ministers rather than the Register General. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the obligation to report on census returns and lay these reports before the Scottish Parliament falls on the Register General, as set out in Section 4.1 of the Census Act uh, Review. And, and there are a number of reasons, and I think that's maybe where Annabelle ewing uh, was referring to, there are a number of reasons while placing a new obligation on Scottish ministers to report on the implications of the changes to the census brought about by this bill would be inappropriate. Um, the most significant of which is the involvement of ministers in relating to the production of statistical reports, which is something that must remain independent and is not something that I can support. And I believe and I think Parliament would agree 
that anything involved in the reporting, uh, production and operation of the gathering of statistics should be independent of whoever the government minister is of the day. Now, that doesn't stop ministers um, responding to the National Records of Scotland's uh, report. And of course, the committee can, I would expect, review the census um, and, and its operations. And it's for those reasons um, that I don't support the amendment. And I also consider the amendment to be unnecessary as the Register General is already legally obliged to report on the census returns. But again, I will request that the Register General Paul Lowe uh, writes to Jamie Green uh, to provide, and the committee uh, to provide the necessary reassurance of the approach that national records will be taking to achieve the sensible principles um, of the amendment. Um, as I said, the Register General has a duty and must report to Parliament. Um, I hope I've again provided uh, Jamie Green and the committee with enough information to provide reassurance that national records of Scotland are alive to the issues raised by the amendment and the National Records of Scotland plans for uh, Census 2021 analysis and consideration actually go further than the provisions that is being suggested this, in, in this amendment. So I would ask Jamie Green not to press the amendment. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, um, would you like to wind up and indicate if you wish to press or withdraw your amendment? Thank you, Kavira. Thank you to other members for their, their comments and feedback. That's very welcome. And also for the Cabinet Secretary's kind comments on the, the premise of the, the, the amendment within the limited scope of this act. Um, I I'm gratefully received the uh, confirmation that the Register General's obligations already ex uh, include uh, that requirement to report back uh, anyway. Um, however, um, I guess if I could propose a theoretic scenario that if after the next census the feedback, the, the strong feedback is that the nature of the wording of the questions or the type of questions that are asked uh, are, are, are not widely re well received by those to whom those questions matter, what the government's next steps would be in terms of changes to future census, what the process of that would be and would uh, ministers have the ability to change those questions easily if we deemed that uh, it's, you know, we didn't get it right this time and I think it's important that we do get it right, I think we all agree that. So that's perhaps uh, what, what sparked uh, this amendment. Uh, so I hope the Minister would uh, reflect on that. Um, but on the uh, uh, information given today, I'd be happy to withdraw the amendment. Withdrawing the amendment. Do any members object to uh, Jamie Green withdrawing the amendment? Okay. The question is that sections two and three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right. I now like to call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary, can you move Amendment 4 formally? Uh, formally moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And that ends Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. We shall take a short suspension. Thank you.
The next item on the agenda today is an evidence session on Creative Scotland. This morning we are taking evidence from Ian Munro, the Acting Chief Executive of Creative Scotland, and Isabel Davis, the Executive Director of Creative Scotland, of Creative Scotland Screen Unit. Um, I would like to thank uh, you both for coming uh, this morning. Um, would you like to make any opening remarks? Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, move immediately to the um, Wavehill report, um, which you commissioned um, um, in response to the um, issues that arose around the RFO process uh, last year to evaluate uh, that funding process. Um, I think it's fair to say that many of the conclusions of the, the Wavehill report reflected on um, the committee's own examinations of the RFO um, process. Um, what do you think that you have learned from the Wavehill report? Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody uh, again. Yes, I think um, I, we've digested a lot, and I think it was a very important piece of work. And when I was at the committee last, I, I reported that we'd actually extended the um, exploration of that, that piece of work um, and the issues in order to make sure that we got the, the full value from it to inform the funding review, which I, I imagine we may come to later. So um, a lot of very helpful um, uh, recommendations within that report. I, I suppose in my own mind I've um, been reflecting on it quite heavily and have um, clustered it into three broad areas that, uh, whilst we'll reflect on the full extent of the report and recommendations, the key things that were uh, resonating from my point of view were around some strategic considerations, some uh, external and some internal considerations. And I, I'll, I'll just run through what I see as the kind of headlines of that. Um, so on the strategic uh, front, I think there's um, a lot of reflection and useful uh, commentary there about the potential, f the, the, the length of the funding period. You know, current regular funding is a three-year cycle, um, and you know, the planning horizons of cultural and, and creative organisations um, is such that they want to have long planning horizons. So, that, you know, that a longer funding period is definitely something to be uh, considered within the, the funding review. Um, the one-size-fits-all approach, we have such a, a variety of organisations that wish to apply for regular funding from Creative Scotland. Um, variety of scales, um, diversity of art forms and so on and so forth across the geography of Scotland that um, there's something about the one-size-fits-all model which is particularly challenging. Um, and ideas around segmenting the process um, in some way uh, was something else that was very, very clear. Uh, and that kind of leads on to the kind of process be, uh, being uh, seen as too onerous for many organisations. Um, so we need to reflect on, on that as part of the work. And there are ideas in here around a two-stage process, for example, which might be a kind of lighter touch initial um, part of the process. And then those that are able to move forward within that process then invited to submit more detail. <clears throat> Um, excuse me, and, and finally on that strategic one, there, there's a lot of debate around those organisations that are too important to fail, i.e. what is a national cultural, healthy uh, national cultural infrastructure look like and how can we best support that through these kind of processes. On the external, um, there's a lot there around transparency, you know, the process is perceived to be clear in certain regards and then opaque in other regards. I think we've got to really address that one and make sure that the transparency and indeed the accountability of that process over, over its um, end to end is, is absolutely clear to people and that and people have, are able to both inform that but also uh, in terms of its design through the funding review but also uh, able to see and understand how the decisions are taken and um, why we've taken them. Um, there is something in here also from an external point of view about more open engagement during the process. I mean, I think we need to look at the length of timescales involved in it. Um, uh, it was an extended process last time uh, around, in part um, because of budget setting timescales that impacted, but um, ultimately I think the, the design of the process should be as focused as possible. Um, uh, in, 
in a way that enables us to explain as we go what is happening and people have the ability to interact with that. Um, and finally, on the external, there's a, a point about guidelines on acceptable con uh, conduct. I mean, I've noted before that it was a bruising experience for everybody uh, all round, internal and external to the organisation. I think we operate as Creative Scotland with a very clear sense of professional conduct that um, we need to understand um, and, uh, and expect that that is re reciprocated uh, when we have very challenging news uh, to give. On the internal, um, final, final set of, of thoughts for me in terms of key learning points. From the staff point of view, there was a lot of training and support in place for them. I think what um, is clear that we can and should do more to support staff um, and, and training around these processes. They are big, um, all organisational processes. I think it's important that staff feel that. Something about better communications flow um, across the organisation so that people have got a greater understanding of what's happening, how and who's involved. <clears throat> and also something very important which came through, um, highlighted through the, the complaints on, on the process the last time about the quality assurance work. So ensuring that the consistency and quality of the assessments is um, quality assured uh, to stand up to the scrutiny ultimately when we um, communicate the decisions. Um, and the final one internally is about the dynamic between staff the executive of the organisation and the board to understand very clearly um, the roles there and who's doing what and how it's happening. I think there was clear reflection in the report about the, the, the tensions at the very end part of the process which um, are captured in the report and I think we've got to be um, much clearer about how the end-to-end -end process works to make sure that that is clear and understood, un understood as we go through it and indeed to get to, get to the right conclusion. What's ultimately as important for me, though, is not the process itself. You know, there's something about pre-application, um, the, the process itself, but actually the, the uh, post-application aftercare, you know, the post-decision aftercare is a very important consideration here in terms of us being able to um, sensitively engage with organisations who are disappointed in the outcome of, of their application. I think we would anticipate that um, we're always going to be um, seeing a tension between the available financial resources um, for these kinds of uh, regular funding programmes and the quality uh, and demand outstripping that. So we're always going to have disappointment that we need, we need to manage. I think opening the organisation and the process up to help design that process so that people have, can have confidence in it and then seeing and understanding how it operates. As I say, ultimately, when, when we, we need to communicate decisions that people have got a greater understanding about why we've reached the decisions that we have. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I go back to the beginning um, uh, when you talked about the, the need for long planning horizons um, uh, and you suggested a two-stage process and and uh, we now know that you're going to undertake further reviews and consultations, which I think members will talk about later. But um, given that you are going to put some sort of new process in place and that you have indicated that people need, organisations need long planning horizons, what will you do to ensure that uh, given that process of change, that they have time to prepare for any change? Yeah, I think what's really important to recognise is, as change progresses, and I'll be happy to speak more about that in more detail, the, the fuller programme of change. Um, it takes time to get the depth of change for the longer term. And what's really important is that we're doing that in the context of continuing to deliver the services and, and, and the business of Creative Scotland that, that people need within the sector. Um, and we can't disrupt that. However imperfect people see the current models of operation, there is a lot of good work that the organisation continues to do, and of course we can get better. Um, so we've got to be able to, as, as we go through the change process, particularly on funding, communicate and engage people around what that is, where we're at, and how they can inform it. But also then, once we're clear through that set of conversations how we uh, have identified the ultimate destination, that we can work out a model of transition between the current model and the new model and do that appropriately in a way, as, as I say, that continues to offer without disruption, um, but creates a very clear route path to get there. We don't know what that is yet, 
um, and that's what the conversations that we're about to embark on will help inform. So one of the, the, the big observations from the committee was that the introduction of the Turing Fund um, the last time was uh, was done without proper consultation, so it was a change in in the middle of the process that people weren't fully informed about, and I take it you know we will not have a repeat of that process. No, as I say, the you know the the opening up will will uh, is intended to do that, but just on the Turing Fund, I think it is a good example that whilst we agree that the in, the initial handling um, could have been better, undoubtedly. The actual process that then ensued in terms of the development of the Turing Fund in conjunction very much with the sector to design it and then be part of the decision making continues and I think it's a good model in terms of um, how actually we would want to move forward in, in being able to involve people in the in the design of these processes. Okay. And another re recommendation of the Wave Hill report is around this uh, the support for key organisations that are deemed to be integral to the national cultural infrastructure, and you know you'll be aware of the row that was very aware of the row around the Scottish Youth Theatres funding, for example. Um, are you in dialogue with the Scottish government over that particular area? These um, areas of the creative sector that are considered to be very important to the national cultural infrastructure, and how you can ensure that they're, um, that they're properly looked after under any future funding process? I mean, we're very, we're very keen and understand that um, people have got different views on what the national cultural infrastructure um, means. I think for, for us, it's important that we have the ability to engage with all of that. Um, I think uh, the tensions are inevitably there about the limitations on our resources and understanding that we are, and the demand against that, and un understanding that we are one part of an overall equation here in terms of being able to support the national infrastructure. I mean, we've um, uh, had discussions with the Scottish Government about um, the Wayfield Report and its recommendations, and, and those conversations will be continuing as we progress through the, through the funding review. But I think... Uh, a lot of the emphasis here is on improving our processes. I think another key part of the equation is the available resources uh, within our, our direct budgets to be able to support the things that we would want to support. And, and again, we may come to that uh, as part of the evidence session today. Just quickly, did your discussions with um, the government um, include the cabinet secretary? Personally, not for me directly in relation to this, but... Um, we have regular uh, contact with the senior officials in the sponsor department on an ongoing basis. Um, my chair, Robert Wilson, uh, does have regular meetings with the cabinet secretary, and I do know that they have discussed it. Right. OK. Um, when was the Wave Hill report published on Creative Scotland's website? And because um, we were told last year that it would be provided to the committee, but, but it wasn't provided to the committee. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. It was a simple oversight. It was published on our website uh, last December. So I'd written to the committee early December to give you an update, and we were just about to publish it at that point. Um, it was an oversight that we didn't actually send you the copy of the, uh, the report at that point, so I do apologise for that. We did it subsequently, but it has been on the website since last December, and indeed we've just republished it as part of the supporting material to inform the conversations that we're about to have on, mm. on the funding review. Okay. Have you provided a full copy of the Wave Hill report to the individuals and organisations that it consulted? And when was that done? Um, we, to my knowledge, haven't done that directly. We have pointed people to it. Um, it I, I believe that it's had traffic... Um, from the consultants direct themselves online. Um, but we, we didn't issue it as such to the, the consultees. Right. That was in the hands of the, the consultants. Right. But you commissioned it. Do you think, would, would you be issuing it to the consultees or as part well, we, of your public we promoted review? it more widely. Um, as I say, it was published on the website last December and we've pointed right. people to it and certainly people have been engaging with it because they've been right. talking with us about it. Right, yeah. but you're not, you don't have a plan to highlight it or send it out to those who were consulted as part of the process? 
Uh, no, uh, not not directly. As I say, that would normally be something handled by the consultants, but we've certainly been very public about it in terms of its uh, positioning on the website and its promotion. Okay. As I say, we've just done it again. So. Okay. I think I've got a brief supplementary from Stuart McMillan on this topic, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Just uh, the point regarding the national cultural infrastructure. Uh, was touched upon and uh, when we had the debate in the Chamber on Tuesday regarding musical tuition, uh, Tabby Scott raised the point regarding how important the, the fiddle is to Shetland's traditions and also across Scotland the issue of the, the bagpipes. Um, is, is this uh, an aspect that, that, you, that you feel that uh, organisations and associations who actually help not solely with these instruments but other traditional instruments should be supported? Absolutely, and we do support many of um, those in, in relation to our work in, in uh, Gaelic and Scots. Uh, a whole range of organisations supported there within regular funding, as an example, but also, <coughs> so for example, um, Fish and Gael, um, Fish Roche and so on, um, who uh, are very much supporting this activity in, in, in communities right across Scotland and, and very much focused on young people too. Um, so yes, it's an important aspect of, of our work. I mean, I, I think instrument, instrumental tuition um, is complementary to the work that we do on YMI, for example, which is a comprehensive programme right across 32 local authorities, um, are reaching, uh, most recent um, figures were nearly a quarter of a million young people. Um, and that's broad music um, participation and music making. Um, and it's complementary to the instru instrumental music service within local authorities. So you know, there's a whole range of facets to this that we pursue. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to pick up on some of the national cultural infrastructure issues. Um, in opening, you described the uh, current funding system as a, the, you described the limitations of a one size fits all. And I understand that some of the feedback to Wave Hill has been around are there some organisations that are too important uh, not to fund, excluding the national performing companies? Um, would a change of model like that be possible within the financial resources that you distribute at the moment? And if there was to be a move towards a kind of different types of funding of models, um, would what factors would come into consideration? What would you, how would you decide which companies were just too important to fail? I mean, the convener mentioned the Scottish Youth Theatre. Um, it's maybe not that easy to identify what companies would come into that category. I know it's early stages because I understand this morning you've also announced you're doing regional um, consultations on funding models with, um, with arts organisations and with the public. So also, the final point of this is what are the timescales attached? Is this an idea that's just been floated or is there an intention to move forward in that direction? So I very much expect that this will be a key part of the conversations that we'll have with people. You know, I think it's a very, um, very important point about what is a healthy infrastructure across the geography of Scotland. As I said, there are many different views and perspectives on what um, people would want to see or expect to be within that kind of infrastructure. I think we need to recognise that regular funding is only one aspect of it. And we as Creative Scotland are only one aspect of the broader support um, network for uh, artists and organisations across the country. Um, as I say, I very much would see it coming into the, the conversations in order to, to debate that and, and get to a, a form of view on um, what that should look like. But the start of your question was about resources, and I, I've, I've already mentioned that I think um, there are deep challenges there for us as an, as an organisation. Our current um, income comprises two parts. It's roughly £92 million pounds a year. Um, Two-thirds of that is from grant and aid from the Scottish Government and one-third from the National Lottery. Um, of the two-thirds from the Scottish Government, roughly half of that is um, restricted funds for specific purposes for programmes that the Government want us to run. So Youth Music Initiative, Expo Fund, Cashback for Creativity, for example. The other half of the um, grant and aid, the unrestricted fund, is what we use to support other activity. Now, what's important to understand is that we're in a situation currently where 86% of that unrestricted grant and aid from the Scottish Government grant um, is what's funding 
121 regularly funded organisations uh, uh, currently. It leaves very little room to manoeuvre in terms of the current grant and aid balance within that equation, but it also throws more pressure onto the National Lottery Fund. And I feel very um, keenly that the National Lottery is has at its heart public benefit and also the, the principle of additionality, which is there to protect the fact that it should not be substituting for uh, government or other funds. So I think we've got something in the equation here which is uh, to be looked at in terms of how we can deploy our overall resources. We would always want to advocate very clearly for um, enhanced resources that are directly at the disposal of uh, both Creative Scotland and other partners in, in the overall equation. But at the moment, it feels very, very challenged. Our grant and aid budget is just short of 0.2% uh, of the overall Scottish Government budget. Now, if you set that in the context of the broader creative industries as a whole, which include um, the art forms and, and, and arts and culture more broadly, um, the creative industries in, in, in Scotland are one of the key growth sectors within the uh, economic strategy for Scotland. Um, currently, 15,500 creative businesses within Scotland employing 77,000 people and contributing 4.4 billion GVA to the economy. Now, we're delivering that as part of an overall equation with direct resources of 63-ish million from the Scottish Government overall. Now, we've got a very supportive Scottish Government and um, Cabinet Secretary, and we're very grateful for all that they continue to do to recognise culture and creativity and the resources that are there. But it's very clear to us that, given the demand that we see coming through the organisation every day and the limitations on our resources and, and indeed the frustrations that we have about a uh, desire to fund even, even more, um, uh, enhanced resources would definitely enable a transformational effect within um, what culture and creativity means to the country. And I speak about that beyond culture itself. I think that's about cultural value, yes, but it's also about social value and, and economic value. Um, so I think there are deep challenges there in terms of the available resource versus, versus the very clear demand. And I think we're at quite a sensitive tipping point because of the contraction of other resources that are available within the equation, local authorities in particular, um, where we're seeing um, contraction of their resources. And they are, they are a very key partner for us um, in being able to support the, the most vibrant cultural life across the, across the country. Thank you. Um, obviously, the committee will be looking more in depth at some of those issues as we've just launched an inquiry into arts funding. Um, can I maybe just stay on infrastructure and ask if there's an update on the Port of Leith studio um, developments? Is there any further information you can give us in terms of the tendering process or timescales or any update? It might be for mm -hmm. Isabel. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, well, um, where we are right now, you, you'll be aware that we launched the tender process in November. Um, we were keen by the end of April to be able to announce an operator. Uh, we're not quite in that position yet. It would be wonderful to tell you today who the operator is, but we are in very advanced negotiations. It's a complex process, um, and we will come back to you as soon as we can on that. Um, it's a, a project that makes advances every day. Um, we're feeling very confident about it, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, that, that's good to hear. Um, so you're hopeful that maybe by the summer we would possibly have a clearer picture of development? Yes, certainly. And uh, we've said as well that we, we're, we're very hopeful that it can still be operational by the end of this year. Um, so certainly we, we will come back to you as soon as we can, yes. I mean, I, um, we, we haven't set a date for that, but... but you know, I certainly hope by summer that we'd be in a position to, to come back with more news on that. Um, I'd like to say as well that this is in the context of a huge uplift in the number of inquiries that are coming to Scotland, um, wanting to use that facility when it's available. Um, we're, we're feeling very keenly the, the, the heated market for um, studio space across the world, so it, it will be very, very exciting for Scotland to be able to pay, take its place in that, in that global picture. Uh, that, that's very welcome. Um, and while the larger studio infrastructure is something the committee has been calling for um, for a while, and we had the inquiry um, last year, is there other work being done to try and develop other capacity throughout Scotland, whether that's a different scale than what we're hoping for in the Port of Leith, but what kind of other projects are underway? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we, we totally acknowledge uh, the need for a variety of space, not only for those large-scale productions that may land in Bath Road, um, but for TV production of high-end TV scale, but also for, for, for local domestic returnable shows as well. Um, we are working with our Screen Commission and with the sector, um, visiting every site that is, that is put in front of us. We know that there are a number of, of people, um, including Stuart, who've, who've highlighted space across Scotland, um, and, and we'll look at every opportunity to find space. I think the, the, the model of, of conversions is, is a really good one, if, if we can make that work. It has to be said there are a number of factors around um, what a client is looking for, be that a, a local TV show or something that's coming in from you know, the other end of the country, for example, or from the US. So there's a technical spec and there's a need for space to be in a particular area to have the right connectivity with regard to proximity of crew, uh, air, um, rail lines and airports. Um, so, so we are looking at a number of factors and, and that will determine whether or not studios can work. You'll be aware of some of the um, privately led um, uh, projects uh, that are out there, so Salter's Gate is, is the latest one um, that we, we're very hopeful. We're working with them along with um, a number of other inquiries that we get on a regular basis. And so in addition to promoting existing space across Scotland that can be converted at short notice, um, that, that's, that's something that's an ongoing piece of work by a Screen Commission. Of course, that's in tandem with the range of support at Screen Scotland, um, be that financial incentives such as a production growth fund, such as the Recce Fund, um, that is another service offered by the Screen Commission that makes Scotland a very attractive place to come and film. So that offer in its totality is what, is what we're able to offer to um, uh, companies looking to set up new space and indeed to clients looking at the range of, of facilities that they might use either temporarily or on a more long-term basis. Um, the final point, I suppose, is that, of course, you know, given the, the strictures on public funding, um, the, the amount of it and also the restrictions around state aid, we do need to see bids come forward that are driven by the private sector. That's really the only way that these things are going to work. So bringing the best industry intelligence to that piece is something that we're very committed to doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. Um, just to start off with, wondering Ian, if you could give us a quick update on the uh, recruitment process for the permanent chief executive post. Um, so the, it's really a question for the board, but um, of course I'm uh, pleased that the board have fully mandated me um, to drive forward the change programme, and that has the support of the, the Scottish Government. My understanding is that uh, there will be an open process for the permanent chief exec recruitment, um, and that would be taking place um, at some point in the near future. But in the meantime, I'm very firmly in the seat, making sure that we uh, can drive forward the change forward conf confidently with the, the board. Okay, thank you. Um, and then to, to move back to uh, issues around screen and specifically the, the Leith uh, development, um, Isabel, in an exchange of letters earlier on, you'd mentioned to myself that there was going to be a meeting with the Association of Film and TV Producers in Scotland in April uh, regarding uh, issues that they'd raised about the development. I was wondering if you could give us an update on how that meeting went. Um, I, I haven't been present at a meeting. We've reached out a number of times to AFTPS. Um, unfortunately, they haven't come to the table yet, but we'd really like to, to meet with them and hear their concerns directly. Grant. Um, on the, the wider issue of, of industry consultation, just having a look through the, the business plan this morning, I was wondering if you could take us through what industry consultation there was in the development of the overall plan. Thank you. Um, well, the first thing I'd like to say is that our, our business plan has come directly out of the work that was done by industry in the lead up to this. So this is very much, if you like, the, the son or the daughter of the collaborative proposal that was put together by industry and government. And we're very, very grateful for that blueprint, um, which uh, set out very, very clearly industry need and a number of recommendations. So the business plan is the expression, if you will, of the next stage of that, um, which is our ability to implement those ideas and overlay them with um, the, the developing um, landscape as it comes forward and looking at how we are able to uh, take forward in a practical way all of those ideas that have come forward. So um, industry has been involved the whole way throughout. Um, I started at the beginning of September. I have been talking uh, fairly constantly with industry um, who've been, I have to say, tell you, very, very supportive. Um, they have indicated by and large, they're extremely happy with the direction of travel. Um, the other interventions that we have are that um, since the birth of Screen Scotland, we have three board members at Creative Scotland who have very long and illustrious careers in TV, who've been extremely dynamic 
presence for us um, as we've developed the business plan. They're present at the screen committee um, and they're, um, they, they've been on the phone and uh, you know, really I have a hotline to all of them if I need it, as, as does my team, to make sure that we are checking in always with, with um, industry best practice. Um, beyond that, um, you'll notice that there are eight areas of delivery within the plan. Each of these has been taken forward by groupings of Screen Scotland staff, so um, that, that may well be within the Creative Scotland um, sort of lead, lead partnership, um, but very often in partnership with the other members of Screen Scotland. So, for example, the skills strategy will be let, um, working very closely with the Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland. Um, and, of course, with that, we have industry around the table and we also have the sector around the table. So, for example, the Creative Media Network, which is now the one-stop shop for all of the higher and further education colleges delivering film and TV skills in Scotland, is very much around that table. So. I would say we're pretty porous in the way that industry is able to communicate with us. Um, final point is my, my email address and phone number are on our website. So I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting very used to being approached, which is extremely welcome. Um, and, and people are finding, hopefully, that that's a nice open process. If I can't answer the question myself, then we have a number of specialists within the team now who are, who are able to help. Grant, um, the plan mentions the intention to sign a memorandum of understanding with Channel 4, I imagine similar to the, the model with the BBC. Could you give us a, an update on progress towards that and if there's a, a, a date it's expected to be signed by? I don't think we've um, landed on a date, but the conversations are very much ongoing. Um, we're very, very happy to have the BBC MOU out there into the world, and that's been well received. Um, I, I think it provides a model in the sense that... Um, it's, it's held up a very ambitious but very achievable target, we believe, for the number of um, Scottish-originated uh, programmes to uh, achieve a network release across the UK. But it also lays out steps as to how we get there. Um, talent progression is a really important part of how we will achieve that together with the BBC and with industry. So in that regard, it's a template. But we're also very keen that it's not a cookie-cutting exercise. And that's something that we need to work with with, with Channel 4, which has um, other specialisms um, that, that may or may not reflect where, where we go with the BBC. Actually, um, Channel 4 and BBC have been very collegiate about where there are where there is common ground as well, so there may well end up being areas in which we all work together. Um, beyond Channel 4, um, there are a number of other partners in the mix who may well want some form of strategic relationship. Some are telling us they don't want an MOU, it doesn't really work for them to have some you know, piece of paper, they'd much rather work in a more dynamic way, and that's fine too, but there are a number of conversations ongoing, and indeed with STV um, and, and other, uh, other of the platforms further afield. Thanks. There's a, a helpful section in here around business support um, and there's some quite ambitious targets, not just in this plan, but in, in Screen Scotland's overall output, you've stated some quite ambitious targets around um, attracting international productions in particular. I was wondering what consideration you've given uh, towards ensuring that business support given to international productions has a long-term positive impact on the domestic industry here in Scotland. There's comparisons elsewhere of um, the requirement to receive financial support is dependent on uh, an obligation to take on a number of apprentices during the production, etc. Have there been considerations of any measures such as that? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think for international production, uh, the financial support is mostly... Um, predicated on the production growth fund and absolutely that is um, a selective fund it is it is based in part on spend so we set very um, if I can put it this way quite aggressive targets and very ambitious targets for a spend ratio um, for productions coming into Scotland but not only that um, any production that is in receipt of that money um, only gets it um, after a very robust conversation with the team around what it's going to deliver in terms of benefits to the local industry so that might well be crew it might be bringing on new apprentices as you say it might be giving um, opportunities for progression for crew from Scotland to move up a grade um, so, so it, it's um, we, we, we like the design of it being in part very clearly about um, elevating the amount of spend that Scotland will receive, but not solely being based upon that in order that we can work with the grain of every production that comes to us and negotiate a really good deal for Scotland. So that's um, a, a key way in which we will ensure that um, the local industry benefits from the incoming production. It's a real challenge, I think. It's something that the UK is facing overall. I've seen this from previous work that I've done before 
before coming up to Scotland, that um, you know the, the the runaway train that is in international production and the very very overheated market um, and the huge numbers of spend that come in um, can you know can be a challenge when you're looking at capacity issues where you know in in the end e even with a um, in a country with a, as advanced an industry as, as the UK, where we have an exceptionally deep uh, crew base, uh, you still end up with um, a competition for crew, and that's something that we're very, very alive to as we develop um, all of the initiatives around growth in tandem. So you've mentioned business development supports, and that's absolutely right. Um, but it, it, it's very, very allied to a skills strategy, which in turn is allied to an infrastructure strategy that says that you know you can't um, think that we will build it and they will come. You know we have to build the base around that in order that we can support uh, studio work with with local indigenous high-end uh, skills at the same time. Thanks. And just one final question, Kavina, for this time. Yeah. yeah, but just very briefly, I think it's, it's quite clear from the, the plan, the role that a number of other agencies uh, are playing in this. I was wondering if you could detail a little bit more the role of SDI and what discussions you've had with them so far about the role they'll play. Um, well, SDI have been extremely helpful and supportive. Um, we have worked with them um, with Scottish Enterprise uh, about... Um, uh, how, how the role that they can play in international promotion of, of, of Scotland. Um, it's, um, it, it's something that I think we'll see more of as we develop an international strategy, which um, is, is um, at, at the moment focused very much on bringing in those international productions to Scotland, but I think that there's more that can be done to um, promote Scotland on the international stage, not, not least as a very strong European partner, um, but um, in, in practical terms around production and in, in, in terms of exporting our content and our talents, I, I see a, a role in the future for SDI, and that's something we'll take up with them in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. I mean, you've talked about the, the need to identify in Creative Scotland that we, you have the sustained support uh, and the empowering communities, and that's been talked about about how you manage that. And, and there's also been the need uh, to ensure that you're not too reliant on volunteers and you've identified that yourself. Uh, but when you look at the skills development and the, and the strategy that they're putting forward, uh, how can you ensure that that does happen and that you do have that creative business environment and you're, you're supporting the creative business and you're getting the creative business people actively involved? So my, my first question would be, how, can you, how are you achieving some of these uh, goals at present and and what are you doing to manage the the challenges of making sure that that does take place so the <clears throat> the work we're doing in the broader creative industry is not just screen um, is very much about how to grow sustainable businesses um, and what uh, we're actively involved in is looking at how we can provide uh, the right forms of support that creative businesses need. Now that's a conversation with Scottish Enterprise, Business Gateway, HIE and so on and so forth. Um, because I think at the moment there's a there's a feeling that there's a kind of complexity of the offer there that, that people don't really understand or can navigate very easily and achieve um, access to the kind of business development support that they require. So very much is part of the overall strategy for us in terms of creative industries to um, to work with partners to get in place a more effective business development support network uh, more broadly. It's a work in progress. Um, I think uh, there's uh, been a number of collective conversations with partners about the current forms of support. Uh, but what's very interesting at, at this point in time is that Scottish Enterprise itself, who's a key partner here, um, is going through uh, its own strategic uh, refresh and the, the services it's going to be offering. And that's a very positive direction tra of travel from our point of view. And I uh, had a recent very positive conversation with uh, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise recently, um, including in this regard. And what we're agreed on is that we need to get around the table again um, to look at this in more detail with the relevant people within our organisations in order to work out how we can get a plan in place to uh, strengthen what is already there and, uh, and, and improve that offer. Yeah. Identified, you, you've got a good template already uh, and what, what, you've, what you've achieved in the past. Uh, but can I ask about how, how you're prioritising the resources that you have to ensure that that skill base uh, and that development is now taking place? Uh, because 
as you go forward uh, and you're, you've identified the, the many opportunities you have, uh, but you've also identified the challenges that are placed upon you, and budgetary challenges are one of the biggest, uh, to ensure that you can have that broad cape ability of ensuring that you, you do bring in the skills and you do bring in that development and that process. So, so how are you going to prioritise the, the resources and ensuring that does take place? It, it's an undoubted challenge. I come back to the point I made earlier about general resources that are directly at the disposal of Creative Scotland. They are limited, and I've already shared that in our grant and aid um, part of the equation, 86% of that is, is invested in 121 organisations. And you know, we, we would and could do a lot, a lot more with, uh, with more investment. So there's a combination of things here. I think we would always want to advocate for more direct resources in the hands of Creative Scotland. But part of our approach is also to understand that the work that we do is very much a partnership approach. And it's about taking um, these conversations forward in a way that unlocks the opportunities and potential resources in other partner organisations that play into the equation overall. And that's certainly the, the approach um, currently in the arrangements with Scottish Enterprise in terms of that direction of travel. And it's all about managing how you review and how you monitor that progress uh, and to see what is actually being achieved, uh, because uh, there, there, there's a big gambit for you to, to, to take on board, but at the same time you need, you need to prioritise uh, and you need to be quite focused as to what you can achieve uh, and, and to ensure that you do get that uh, success or the easy win or the gain initially uh, that then builds on that, uh, that gives you the confidence and gives others the confidence uh, in, in you managing to progress that. Uh, so so how, how, what, what, what plan of action is there uh, to ensure that that monitoring, that progress does take place? I mean, it will come out of these conversations in terms, once we're absolutely clear about what it is that we're, that we're keen to pro progress, um, then we can understand the best mechanisms to monitor progress and delivery and so on. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's one step at a time at the moment. I think we've very firmly got our sights set on this as a priority. Um, but I think, going back to the broader point about creative industries, I think it's worth the committee knowing that we... Uh, we hold this brief in relation to the creative industries, and I, I've set out earlier 15,500 businesses, 77,000 em, uh, employees, and, and GVA of 4.4 billion to the economy. Um, there are no direct resources in Creative Scotland from um, Scottish Government in relation to that uh, work. Uh, we do it from within existing resources. Um, at the moment, we've got a team of seven working on that agenda directly with a discrete budget of half a million pounds from national lottery funding. So there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's something within our overall conversations here which are partly about strategic focus, and I agree with you about priorities, being much clearer about who and what we're here for and what our priorities are, and the available resources to enable us to m move forward confidently in a way that's directly in the hands of Creative Scotland to deliver against the brief that we've got, and uh, not always so relying on partnership working, which is time intensive, and unlocking um, the other resources that are available in, in other agencies and uh, public bodies. Important though that remains too. And you know the, the new entrance into the industry is vitally important too, and the support mechanisms that you can give them uh, to ensure that they have uh, you know, they have the idea or they have the potential, but they need that support. Uh, and without that support, they may not achieve their goals. Uh, so you have to try and bridge that gap uh, and support them through that, uh, because you want the industry to continue to cultivate and expand and, 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 re and regenerate itself. Uh, uh, but that is a very difficult thing to do if you do not have all the pieces together to make it the jigsaw fit uh, and ensure that you can uh, provide them with what is required for them to uh, expand and, and unlock their potential. An, an important um, point here, actually, is that we've our director of creative industries is actually a partnership role between ourselves and Scottish Funding Council, um, deliberately uh, in part in that regard to be able to bridge, create bridges, as it were, um, in terms of um, the skills development pipeline, um, and that's been going very, very well on, on, for both organisations, and you know, very much hope that that would continue um, as part of this overall equation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, convener. I mean, Ms. Monroe uh, and uh, Ms. David, uh, good morning. Um, 
Mr Munro, you said that uh, you know, Creative Scotland got £63 million pounds from the Scottish Government. You said that this was uh, frustrating and uh, obviously it having these limitations on resources. I mean, what, what do you believe the optimum fund le funding level should be for Creative Scotland and what would that deliver? You talked about the £4.4 billion, but uh, uh, what kind of gearing effect do you think there would be if there was additional funding for Creative Scotland um, in terms of you know, additional employment on GVA? I think so. The, we're reflecting on this at the moment in terms of the, the funding review, just looking back at our own um, funding equation, understanding its output, uh, its impacts and, and outcomes and so on. Um, I think we absolutely recognise the pressures right across the public sector and indeed beyond in terms of private sector and so on and so forth. But what we know and understand, for example, is that um, our investment through the regular funding organi uh, organisations represents about a quarter of the overall turnover. So th th there's a kind of gearing effect there in terms of um, direct leverage on, on investment for those individual organisations. And of course, there's what they are able to then go on and deliver themselves in terms of uh, uh, cultural, social and economic value to, to the country. I mean, the, the figures around Edinburgh festivals in particular are, are, are well known in terms of hundreds of millions uh, in that regard. Um, What's the optimal? Good question. In terms of international comparators, I think we're broadly um, the same, give or take, in, in relation to spend per head of population across the UK, um, slightly lower in, in, in some regards. But when you look at international comparators, it becomes quite stark. So Ireland, Norway, Sweden, spend per head of population in terms of culture and creativity is markedly higher by, by some degree. Um, I think we're realistic. We've got, as I said, we've got a very supportive um, uh, Scottish government and uh, cabinet secretary, and we realise the pressures on these other other areas of public budgets. But less than 0.2 of the overall Scottish government budget um, feels uh, that it's it, it's not in tune with the actual potential here in terms of creative industries as a whole being a growth um, sector for Scotland as a whole. So. Realistically, to get it even up to 0.5% would be transformational enough in itself. It would um, take us up to uh, to 160 or so million and in 0.5% of the budget overall, which in real terms is a lot of money, but in terms of a £34.5 billion pound Scottish Government budget to deliver the, the breadth of what Creative Scotland is expected to do um, is certainly taking us in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> you know, it's always easy to, to call for another 100 million, but it, it's more difficult to say where in the Scottish budget that should should obviously come from. And I mean, when I was convener of finance, we always said to people, um, if you're looking for additional money, you have to tell us where you think it should come from in the Scottish budget. I'm not going to ask you to do that specifically, but nor am I going to talk about the per capita spend across Scotland, because as we discussed before, uh, there's huge disparities within the country. But you, you have put in the, your evidence, I think it is an interesting, the open project funding, there were £154 million pounds in terms of bids, but only £102 million was was awarded, and of 1177 applications, only 493 were awarded. So clearly, there are more people are looking for funding. So, in that regard, EU funding for projects um, apparently there's been a minimum of 23 million pounds of EU funding in the last decade, and there's uh, that obviously uh, is likely to um, disappear. Now, there's a proposed UK shared prosperity fund being uh, at least considered al allegedly by the UK government. It was supposed to be a consultation before Christmas. It didn't actually happen. We don't know where we are on that. Have you had any indication of um, where um, whether that will uh, come through? And um, if if not, um, how will that gap be plugged? Will you be looking for additional funding from the Scottish government? Because what you've basically said is um, that this is needed to support development of creative sectors if significant investment is not to be lost, and it particularly be felt by rural areas of Scotland where EU funding has been critical. So what we're, uh, I think they have been consulting on the Shared Prosperity Fund and we've certainly been, uh, the, the team in Creative Scotland have been um, engaging in that regard. What we're advocating for, because it's not clear, is um, 
hasn't taken place, which might be launched before Christmas, hasn't taken, hasn't actually happened as far as there I have, understand. There have been conversations about yeah. it that, um, that we've been taking part in. What we are not clear about is whether it will be UK-wide. And of course, we are advocating very strongly in those conversations that it, it needs to be um, UK-wide. And we'll continue to do that. I think it is important to recognise the, the value of what comes through in terms of European funding. Um, because that 23 million that you refer to that's come into the sector, you know, two thirds of that, I think, it is um, is actually from non-cultural budgets. <laughs> you know, so it is an important overall component part of um, of the equation here that uh, we would be concerned about. Thanks. And, and Ms. Davis, um, I was looking at the business plan that we got this morning, and I've, I've been listening to your comments today about the need, and indeed, it's emphasising the business plan to. Uh, do more to create apprentices, nurture Scottish talent, give experience to Scottish crews, etc. But when I was looking through it, I looked at page 13 and again at page 21, and I noticed on page 13, funding has been provided for a film called Yuli, which I understand was made in Cuba by a Scottish-based director, and Freedom Fields on page 21 was indicated by... Uh, it was about Libya. I'm not sure if it was made actually in Libya, but it was, again, a Scottish-based producer... Um, how does in spending money in these overseas, overseas effectively actually help deliver more, optimise uh, the spend in terms of Scottish um, screen development? Because um, uh, to me it, it seems odd that if you're trying to attract uh, investment here and develop films and talent here, that money is being awarded so that people can make films somewhere else. Okay. Um, well, uh, it's an ecosystem. Um, there's a very well-worn um, uh, network and matrix of international funding that works together. Um, this is bound together by a number of international co-production treaties, which are signed by countries in order to allow skills and talent to exchange and to grow. Um, and I think that the net benefit to Scotland is absolutely in favour of working in that way. Of course, our talent and our skills travel um, in, in Cuba. So uh, the producer, uh, the director, the writer were Scottish. They work with some of their Scottish crew and some of that work comes back to Scotland. It's not a zero-sum game. So um, the reciprocity of that, of course, is that Scotland then receives incoming production. So we had uh, a Polish crew land with a film called Mr Jones. So um, that was the uh, luminary Agnieszka Holland coming into Scotland. Scotland needs to be playing at the international table in order to grow that base. Um, and the production spend in that regard, in that particular model of co-production, also extends into the export value of those films as well. So in, um, in co-production treaties or in co-production more generally, what you see is a mix of production crew and talent coming together, but also um, the distribution side as well. So um, as you'll know, a film, a film industry can't survive in isolation. Uh, the audiences aren't large enough in, in Scotland or indeed in the UK for a film industry to be sustainable without looking for international audiences as well. Um, so for Scotland to be um, making films that have an international appeal, that attract international distribution, is how finance flows into the business um, and how indeed um, finance flows into Scotland on Scottish soil as well. So the jobs and the growth in any case, regardless of where that activity is taking place, still return benefits to Scotland. Um, but there is a bigger ecosystem there um, which allows Scotland to play in that international arena and to attract international finance and audiences to its films. That's great. Well, thanks very much for that. I think that's really interesting. I'd like to see more of that in the business plan, just to explain that, because I think it's quite, it's quite important for people looking at it in a, a two-dimensional way. I don't think you really see that. But just one last question, if I may, convener. And it's just about, I noticed that you have a range of screen funds available, nine different funds from Broadcast Content Fund right down to Professional Development Fund. It seems to me um, nine, nine funds within the budget you have seems quite, quite a lot of funds. It's, are these in silos, or is there more flexibility? Because, I mean, if I was deciding to produce something here, and I'm looking, there's nine different funds, they apply to that one, they apply to that one. Would it not be better to have one general fund in which you could apply, if you, you know what I mean, with, uh, with under, under a different criteria? It just, I'm obviously hoping you'll give me a good explanation here, but it just seems quite, on the surface again, re quite restrictive to have nine separate funds for the fairly limited resources you have. I thought it would just be one fund you could apply to for whatever it is you, you require funding for. Um, well, <coughs> I, I, I suppose I'll come back to the fact this, this plan has been built on a blueprint that was put together by industry and that um, there is a range of need. It's, it's quite a complex business. I mean, I think that you know, film and TV share a number of commonalities, but they also have 
points of divergence and um, in order to respond with a really clear set of priorities um, that uh, someone can apply to and know why they have or haven't received the money and that they can make their case. I think that's actually rather important. Um, if anything, I think my, my take is that we move more towards specialism. That means specialist staff who are really um, across the particularities of the distribution picture, audience picture, those are specialists in production and skills, those are specialists in talent development. That for me is the way in which you build a successful model that makes us more than the sum of our parts, makes us more than um, you know, just a bunch of people who write checks. You know, that we, ha we have more value to add by um, being very, very clear and targeted about what it is that Scotland needs and having articulated that in a plan, how then we best support it to come forward. So um, I, you know, the, the, our, our guidelines are always a, a work in process if, if people are um, uh, confused about what it is that we're asking for through these various funds then then that's something that my team is is really ready and, and spends a lot of time actually sort of interpreting and helping support the industry to understand but um, but I, I, I think um, I think it serves the industry best to be really clear about what our priorities are and then to put resource behind it where necessary as long as it's not over bureaucratic no quite yes. absolutely Thank I hope you. Not. thanks Kavir. Thank you very much. J just briefly, in terms of all these funds that you've listed, is there a document which says the amount of money that's attached to each of these funds? Um, well, well, yes. I mean, we, we've we've um, we've put um, numbers against each of those figures in the plan before you, and of course, with regard to the production funds. Uh, that, that figure is very publicly available. So the, the film development and production fund is £4 million a year. The broadcast content fund is £3 million a year. Uh, production growth fund is, is £2 million a year. Um, we do have some flexibility to... Um, move uh, lottery funding across years you know productions are very lumpy business as they say so um you know productions don't fall neatly into you know 4.0 million pounds per year so that's that's um that's where you might see in some of those numbers um a little bit of movement and that that's i think that's a good thing that's that's um that works with the grain of industry practice too um overall we've worked um to cost each area of the plan of course um we're subject to um final budget approval as as any public body is at this, this particular point but we, we have a, a costed plan against each of these items okay thank uh, you sorry can i just add that um that that will be published um ultimately once we get formal confirmation of our uh, budget from the Scottish Government. Okay, and for every single one, I mean, I know some of them we already know the fundings, but every single one will have a, a budget beside it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Annabel Ewing. Thank you. Convener, good morning, and thank you very much uh, for coming in this morning. I, I've just got a, a, to ask Mr. Monroe a procedural uh, question. I, we noted the um, article in the Herald this morning announcing the uh, reporting on the announcement of your intention to proceed with consultation on the, the funding going forward um, and that there were, are to be a consultation workshop meetings in various locations. Um, obviously, in the article, it just gave a flavour of some of the destinations. Can I clarify whether Creative Scotland will be holding one of these meetings in Fife? Uh, I believe so. I will just double check the... Uh... Okay, well, you can maybe... I think it's, just, in, it's important because the, I think there's one in Glen It's important to cover, you know, uh, as much of Scotland as you possibly can, and Fife obviously is a very important part of Scotland. I think Claire would agree with that. So, I mean, I, um, what I will do is double check that. But w what I would say is that this is one set of conversations. Well, indeed, but presumably, yeah. if if Fife is not on the list at the moment, you would want to now add it. I would have thought probably further to this uh, question. But moving on to uh, a broader issue. Um, although uh, retaining some of the, the, the principle underlying my previous question. Um, in uh, your uh, approach, you, of course, um, uh, recognise the importance of close, closer collaboration as between national and local bodies, and that would be essential to deliver on your objectives. And so I just wonder if you could um, give a, a flavour of, of what you foresee in that regard. How do you plan to ensure this closer collaboration as between the national and, and the local I absolutely re would reinforce the point about the importance of local government within um, the overall support infrastructure for uh, healthy cultural offer across Scotland. We in many regards have engagement with local uh, government uh, in different forms regularly. I think what we recognise though is that as things are shifting in terms of uh, public finance in particular, and I mentioned earlier that there, there are key pressures now that are 
um, uh, demonstrating that it feels like there's a bit of a tipping point in relation to cultural support. Um, we need to, to look at a, a more strategic approach to understand what those issues are with local government directly and have conversations with them about what the solutions around that might be. So we're doing two things um, as part of that programme of work this year, whilst we continue to do all the other things that we, that we do anyway. Um, one is a very specific piece of work to research uh, with local authorities and other partners and stakeholders what the challenges actually are to understand those issues and once we've done that to gather everybody around them um, to have a discussion about how we can move to uh, more effective collaboration in a changing world um, and ensure that we that we have got the most effective relationships there. Um, that piece of work is about to be commissioned next week it will report in the autumn and we will be publishing it in due course and would fully anticipate that we that we host an event for discussion around that very specific piece of work in due course. The other thing that we're doing is um, prompted by a very immediate piece of work that uh, we've been part of around the Cultural Cities Inquiry. Um, and Dame Shona Reid from Scotland was part of the overall steering group for that. So tomorrow in Perth we are convening Scotland's cities as, as local government um, and Shona Reid will be there too as part of the conversations to understand that report um, and the principles within it and the ideas within it in terms of um, new and different ways of thinking about how uh, culture can be supported to best effect in this changing environment that we're going through. So there'll be a lot of, uh, of good value coming out of that. The one thing that I would say around that though is that whilst it's focused on cities because of the nature of the cultural cities inquiry, the principles within it can equally be um, deployed across the geography of Scotland um, in terms of the, the ideas and thinking within it, um, be that in terms of regions or indeed individual local authorities themselves. So I think that will be part of the conversation that we have um, tomorrow and we'll, we'll see where that goes in terms of next steps. Um, okay, thank you for that. A couple of follow-up points, uh, questions. Um, so the, the first uh, piece of work that you referred to looking at the position vis-a-vis -vis local authorities in general, what, what is, sorry, the, the timing for that? When do you expect to...? We're, commission, we're uh, issuing the commission next week and it will take place in terms of its kind of research and consultation over the course of the summer with a view to concluding in the autumn. Okay. Um, so by the end of this year, we will have a report, and we, as I said, we will, we will be publishing that okay. report. Um, and subsequent to its conclusions and recommendations, we'll then understand next steps by way of uh, uh, how we take it forward thereafter. And the cities, the cultural cities work, is that on a more accelerated basis? Uh, tomorrow, uh, the actual meeting itself, again, dependent on where that goes, we'll, we'll understand what the next steps on that may be. Okay, and tomorrow will just be cities reps attending. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I get, I get that, and you know, I, I think it's important that culture is available all over Scotland, including, of course, in our um, our cities. But I, I just wonder when you said there uh, that, um, you know, that you would anticipate that the the work in the cultural cities inquiry could extend, you know, across Scotland, other urban areas, rural, remote. Um, but I, I suppose there would be a, a, an element of caution with that because by the very nature of, of other areas, which are not cities, there are other issues prevalent and I, I would hope that that would not be lost in that discussion because that then would defeat your recognition of the, the, the need for closer collaboration between national and local. Um, if, if one just sort of sought to apply wholesale the outcome of your city's work to the rest of Scotland, that may not actually suit the rest of Scotland. So hopefully that's very much at the forefront of your endeavours with regard to the city's cultural work. Yes, I mean, I, I, what I'm suggesting is that there are interesting ideas and principles there that could be of value in other parts of Scotland, not just cities. Um, but that's absolutely, you know, tomorrow is a starting point in terms of the conversations. And yeah, I'm sure this will come up, but we will we will thereafter see and understand what we may want to do next by way of taking anything within um, the conversations from tomorrow forward in due course. Yeah. Okay, and the, the work, uh, lastly, and then I've got a question if I may for uh, uh, Isabel, uh, Isabel Davis. Um, but to, to Ms. Renault, um, the, the work then, the, the first piece of work uh, that you mentioned as regards local authorities in general, would that involve all local authorities? Yes. You plan to work with them? Okay. 
Absolutely. Great. Um, and indeed, we may we may also look at reference points beyond Scotland in terms of um, anything that's relevant. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, can I ask as well, Davis? Um, so, in terms of one of the uh, uh, strands of work of Screen Scotland, so the film festivals fund. Uh, and I'm very pleased indeed to see that uh, in my constituency of Cowden Beath, uh, uh, Kelty will be launching their inaugural film festival on the 24th of May, just do a wee uh, blurb for them. Uh, it will last the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It looks like uh, an excellent programme, and I know that they receive funding from the, the, the Challenge Fund. Um, can I just ask, I, I understand there's a further round of this uh, fund upcoming, and how do you ensure that people are aware of that? Because obviously the point would be to involve as many local communities, be it my constituency or anybody else's constituency, so that they were aware of that and they could take a view of whether that's something that they could get involved in. Um, well, we, we have a very lively comms team and they have been um, expanded as a result of uh, Screen Scotland. Um, so we rely quite a lot on, on the website and social media and the connections that we have and the mailing list that we have um, throughout Scotland. So that, that's really our plan. If you have other suggestions, we'd be more than happy to, to hear from you on that. Um, we, uh, as you say, the, the intention of that fund is very much about um, uh, getting film into the parts of Scotland that, that, that wouldn't otherwise get to see that range, diversity and breadth and, and of, of excellence in filmmaking across the world. So we are very, very um, happy to do whatever we can to get the word out further. There and how I can ensure that other parts of my constituency, seeing the great example that Kelty is setting, uh, if, see if they might wish to, to, to pursue uh, such an initiative. But just a final question, what, what is the overall size of that fund? Um, do you, um, know, do you have that? If not, question. you can let us um, Can I perhaps come back to you? Yes, please. It might be that's subject, subject to um, further budget confirmation. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thank you very much. Uh, ju just for clarification, um, the review that you're doing with local authorities and the alios, um, can you share the results of that with the committee when it's completed? Yes, absolutely. And as, um, as I said, it will be published online as well. Right. But, yeah, okay. I will make but sure that If you could alert us this time, time and, and, and yeah. send it to us, that would be Lesson fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just uh, once again want to thank Creative Scotland and Isabel Davis in particular for coming to the event I hosted in Greenock uh, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, certainly, in terms of uh, questions, uh, I'm not going to go into the questions regarding a, a film studio because obviously some of them have been touched upon and we've had those discussions uh, before. But it just uh, some aspects regarding the uh, Scottish Enterprise has been touched upon regarding the, the business development. Uh, clearly, th there was a bit of an issue in the past. Uh, with, uh, with, the, with the confusion uh, regarding Scottish Enterprises' role. Um, so I, I'd be grateful just to kind of get a, a, an understanding as to kind of how things are operating now, uh, not solely also with uh, SE and SDI, but also with, S, uh, with SE, uh, because the, uh, just to make sure that there is a, a, clear, uh, a clear direction going forward. Thank you. Um, so um, SE are clearly partners in Screen Scotland. They're knitted into the fabric of what we do um, through being around the table, through contributing to the business plan. Um, they are present and very active at the delivery level through our project groups and our working groups. And of course, they're represented on the Screen Committee. So um, they have both visibility, oversight and uh, commitments that they are, they are making to Screen through the formal mechanism of Screen. Green Scotland. Um, we have found them to be extremely helpful on the level of um, studio provision. They've been giving advice throughout the whole process. Um, but I think, as, as you say, um, the area of business development is one where we're really bearing down, and we're bearing down on that area with um, the services of a consultant to look at, again, the scope of what industry wants. So uh, very recently, in fact, last week, we had a meeting of that particular project team within Screen Scotland with all the partners around the table to look at what actually is the need, you know, and some very interesting findings have come out of that. Of course, that's, um, you know, that's industry feeding in, as, as, as you will know, um, some, some, sometimes with frustration over the years, and I think sometimes just with, you know, with gen general positive um, collaborative spirits that uh, the gaps that we've identified are around um, company supports um, and also that companies of varying scales, you know, not simply the ones that will make it to that, you know, hallowed sort of £10 million pound turnover that, we, that we've talked a lot about, um, but that we are um, supporting companies with a range of skills across the um, the portfolio of skills from, uh, sorry, portfolio of companies from really those, those startups through to the much larger beasts. Um, how we service that need then um, is something that will be um, the subject of the scoping study, 
with industry consultation happening in early June before we come up with the, the final model. We make sure that the, the money that we're deploying um, and the people that we're deploying and the roles that we create in order to further um, cement business development as part of Scotland's great picture um, will come out of that piece of work. Um, but in the interim, um, we have a very close relationship with SE colleagues. Um, we're in dialogue with them um, very, very frequently. So, so I think things are moving there. I think it would be very useful for the committee to, to have a, an understanding uh, post, so, but when that's uh, produced and that piece of work is done, uh, if you can uh, send information to the committee. I think yeah, it would be very useful. Yeah, happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in terms of the, you mentioned there regarding the roles uh, and, uh, and expertise, uh, what additional skills and expertise uh, are you bringing in to actually deal with the improved business development uh, support? Um, well, um, th th in a sense, that remains to be seen. We're very th th it's very clear um, that there's a need for signposting. I think that's, that's an idea that came through uh, recommendations um, from both the committee and the collaborative proposal that you know, the industry needs to know where, where, where it goes. So there's a, there's a sort of triage function, which may be a combination of, of, of um, human beings and technology. Um, but I think it's also really clear that the industry needs um, very high-end, you know, best-in-class uh, industry advice, um, and that's something that, you know, I, I'd be surprised to find all those skills in one person, if I'm absolutely honest, I think. So I think the model of what that person looks like or what that support team looks like um, will be, um, you know, not, not, not to entirely jump the gun on where this um, piece of work is going, but, um, you know, that, that, that triage service is one thing, but having the resource to give the Scottish industry access to the kind of expertise it needs uh, in a very bespoke way, I think, is the name of the game. Um, what we have right now, uh, whilst that work is going on, is a project called Focus, which you may have heard about, um, which is co-funded both by uh, Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise um, with companies themselves, and it's putting 20 companies from across the film and TV spectrum through a process of growth, bringing in, um, in each case, a bespoke suite of experts across international sales, company growth, finance, um, talent development, if that's what's required, um, helping them individually fill in their gaps in order that they can come out of the other end of that 18-month um, process with, with um, a stronger set of skills and uh, resilience to, to, to grow as Scottish companies. Um, and, and the work that that... Um, uh, outfit is doing uh, with those 20 companies is also expanded to a wider cohort of around 40 to 50 companies that are benefiting from workshops, events and talks from industry experts across the areas that we know are where the gaps are for Scottish companies. So, so we have something of a model there that, that will be reviewed um, after that program finishes at the end of this calendar year. Um, but it, I think it does provide a very useful working model of, of, of how practical supports can be drawn together and done so on a bespoke basis so that our companies are able to avail of, of, of working practitioner knowledge as opposed to you know, another, <clears throat> another talking head in a, in a public body. So, I mean, following on from that then, the, one of our recommendations in the, in the report was to follow a Danish style model. Um, so, so would that actually be comparable uh, and certainly very much work with what you're actually trying to do with this uh, focus project? Um, well, well, I think in, in certain regards, I mean, my, my understanding of the, the proposal with uh, regard to Denmark was that their commissioners, so the decision makers on the funds that go out the door to production, um, that those commissioners are drawn from industry um, and on, on fixed-term contracts. Now, I think there are some sort of employment issues around that, that we'd have with any sort of fixed-term contract, but I think the, the, the principle of bringing in um, industry experts both into Screen Scotland and to finding other ways in which the industry and, frankly, Screen Scotland can avail of... Um, a, current best practice expertise from the sector is a point very well made and something that we're embracing. Um, it's, it's already happening within the uh, makeup of the team itself within Creative Scotland uh, and within Screen Scotland. Um, we have put every single member of the team through an intensive um, induction in terms of TV, um, having the sector come to us and, and talking to us about the realities of working TV, what that market looks like and how we ensure that the funds are fit for purpose. Um, but it's also, I think, as, as you say, exactly, within business developments that we would look to um, avail of best practice, you know, look a, a scan, scan the country for the best people who are prepared to uh, mentor, advise um, on, on whatever basis to make sure that our, our companies are getting the best available support. Uh, and finally, uh, has uh, Screen Scotland secured any, uh, any major productions from any of the FANG companies? 
Um, well, uh, we are in active conversation with um, a number of companies. Um, I wouldn't sing uh, single out the streaming platforms, of course. Anything that we, um, uh, any conversations that we have, um, unfortunately, remain completely confidential. It's a confidential service that, that we um, that we provide for for good reason, of course. But um, what I will say is uh, to re slightly repeat an earlier point that we have uh, never had the volume of inquiries that we're having from across the spectrum of companies, be that film companies, streaming platforms, cable companies, um, companies from the South um, who are uh, feeling the uh, the weight of Ofcom regulation about out of London. Um, so, you know, my, my Screen Commission colleagues are, are, are busier than they've ever been, and thank goodness we've been able to um, in, in increase the, the resource within the Screen Commission with the additional resources from Scottish Government. Yeah, that, that's certainly very useful, and mm -hmm. uh, I think certainly going back to one of your earlier comments regarding Crew proximity, airports and transport, and uh, sp space to be easily converted to short notice. I've got a perfect location for you. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Can't wait to come and see it, Stuart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Jamie Green, did you have other questions that yes. you wanted to come in with? Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to you both. Um, I think I'll do it in reverse order. I'll, I'll carry on the line of conversation that Stuart McMillan was talking about. Um, I've read through your, your business plan. It's, it's a welcome document. Um, however, I, uh, I do have one concern on it, and I wonder if you could comment on it, and that's we've got 57 pages business plan. Admittedly, half those are photographs and pictures, but um, the, well, the one that jumps out at me the most is a very, very small section, page 37, that says crew, talent, and facilities. And it says, we will help production companies find the specialist crew and facility services needed to make productions in Scotland, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and that's it. Uh, other than the discussion around studio space, which I might come on to next, um, that strikes me as a glaringly short and vague statement to make. Surely, if we really want Scotland to be a one-stop shop for production, <clears throat> your business plan would have had far more robust plans about how, you know, we're not just a location service, we're not just providing good, high-quality crew, but it really truly is a one-stop shop where you have adequate studio space, adequate edit editing facilities, Ad adequate, su adequate support for distribution, for example, and all the other elements of creating production, it strikes me that the focus is very much on location and a hope that we might have decent studio space in the next couple of years. Is that enough? Uh, I think you're referring to one of the paragraphs within the second page of Filming in Scotland, which is section 4.7 of the overall plan. Um, so I think it's, you know, if, if that were representative of our entire ambition for um, Screen Scotland, then I'd entirely agree with you that wouldn't be nearly enough. Um, as it is, it, it uh, represents a fraction of the work that is done by the Screen Commission, uh, which is a team within... Uh, Creative Scotland, um, who, who absolutely see that overall picture that you know we that the overall aim is to increase um, the, um, the, the 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 number of productions and the quality of productions that are making Scotland their home. Um, so um, it, it's true that the work of the Screen Commission includes helping point uh, international production in the direction of existing um, locations crew, um, and not only pointing them in the direction of that, but they are supporting um, budgets to be undertaken. They're making the right connections with line producers and with location managers in order that any um, production that is thinking of basing in Scotland can come armed with the right facts and information to make a, um, an educated choice about coming to Scotland. So, so, so the service is quite strategic in and of itself. Um, we absolutely understand the, um, the interplay between having greater uh, depth and diversity of infrastructure. It's a challenge. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, Bath Road is not the be-all and end-all. We're very... Uh, be-all and end-all? Be-all be and end-of. Um, it is... Uh, but it's, it's, it's where a lot of focus is right now. But as I say, the work of the Screen Commission in parallel to that is to continue to um, promote um, a huge range of space that can be converted at short notice um, by productions that are prepared to come in, and, and that, that's, that's a working model as well. So um, our ambition for Scotland certainly goes beyond that, and as you also say, and, and rightly so, I, I totally agree that um, there is a need also to look at, well, you know, how do we best support um, the post-production sector, of which editing is a part. You know, editing actually is a particular challenge, especially if we're looking to production outside of Scotland to grow that mix, because it's always that last piece where the director would like to go home. You know, they're a bit tired of doing their location sheet or their studio sheet. That's the bit that's quite um, 
um, a challenge to persuade on, but that's not to say that the range of excellent post-production facilities, visual effects companies in Scotland that are growing um, uh, need to be really well served and really well promoted um, around the UK and around the world. So, I, I mean, I absolutely hear you on that. Um, we are somewhat um, challenged by um, the, you know, the, the, the ability as a public body to be uh, writing checks to make new, new facilities happen. I mean, that's just, it's just a, a very complex picture and it's something that, you know, in the end we have limited resource. Um, but in promoting these things and by incentivizing the use of them in the correct way or the most effectively calibrated way, um, that's, that's a key part of the strategy. Uh, thank you. I, I, I welcome those, those comments and, and your sentiments there. Um, but I think, are, are you aware of any uh, major production business that you think Scotland PLC has lost out on because we don't have those facilities. We don't have that, uh, you know, broad range of, of studio or, or, or indeed this type of post-production facilities that people need. Any, any evidence of it going to, to other uh, other sectors? Uh, and, and and how do you think we could turn that around? Um, well, I, th I think um, we um, we actually, in, in common with many many industries, are facing a capacity challenge. So it's up to us to rise up to that challenge and to increase um, skills that will make. Uh, post-production in a more lively sector. As I say, I think there are some challenges as we um, familiarise people with working in Scotland. You know, I think that there's always a bit of a perceptional barrier to, to cross when people haven't worked here before. It only takes one to go, do you know what, I had an absolute knockout time. My post-production was done in Scotland and it, and it was excellent. I mean, that, that's, that's certainly that, that sort of referral business is something that can snowball. I think that's really, really important. Um, have we lost out? I mean, I think that, um, you know, you, you can't win business with it, you, that, that you can't service, you know, and there's no doubt that, um, you know, to put it another way, the fact that we are now potentially in the large-scale studio business has shown very clearly that the, the appetite is there um, to come and work in Scotland if, if we can step up to the plate. And on the studio, uh, just to clarify, um, on the following page, the KPI for studio uh, in your plan is a new studio facility refurbished and opened by April 2020. But on the next page, it states our aim is to identify a studio operator in 1920. April 2020 is you know, less than a year away, so it, do you think it will be up and running by next year or is that just when you want to have somebody in place who will be doing the refurb and, and looking to open it sometime in the future? When do you think it will be ready for business? Well, um, we, we, we are uh, certainly intending that it will be operational by the end of this year. So, you know, that, that, that is, is ambitious. Um, but, but that's, you know, we, we, we know what a priority it is. We're working extremely hard, as is the preferred bidder um, and their very talented team around them to, to make that happen. Um, so um, that, uh, does that in any way account for the discrepancy? Yeah. There's, a, there's a sort of, you know, there's a need to identify the operator and then obviously to get yeah, them. Perfectly clarifies on. it. Thank okay. you. Thank um, you. Mr. Monroe, um, just uh, it's going right back to the beginning of the session. You were talking about y your finances. Your, your twenty-two, your ninety-two million pound revenue. Uh, can you explain how much of that is uh, available there f thereafter for funding projects after excluding operating costs, etc.? I'm just keen to get my head around the numbers. Our uh, <clears throat> overheads is approximately ten percent. I mean, it fluctuates according to, to income per se. So there's about eighty-three million pounds available for frontline grants delivery. Yeah. And do you have a worry that, that there's so much reliance that a third of your revenue comes from lottery funding? I know that's decreased uh, in recent years. Uh, and of the two thirds remaining government funding that you get, half of that is in effectively ring fenced and you're told how to spend it. I mean, it doesn't really create a huge pot for the to support all the great work that you do in, in so many of the local projects. And one of the things that this committee has discussed a lot is, is this uh, you know, perception that the focus is often on uh, you know, the centre belt or cities and not enough in our, in our regions, in rural parts of Scotland or in small towns and the areas that many of us represent. Uh, do you think that that remainder pot that you have to spend on those smaller projects uh, is overstretched? Yes, is the short answer. We know that. The evidence is there by way of demand um, statistics. And one of the other things to mention um, that uh, we've just opened up even more information um, through a data dashboard on the website around the spend on open project funding, for example, and, and the application demand. Um, so that data is all now there beyond just a kind of simple grants listing um, in, or, in order to help 
people understand the equation here, but, uh, but absolutely, the, we, we all feel a frustration internally and externally that we know the quality of um, applications that we receive against the available budget is at the heart of some of the issues and challenges that we've got. But what I would say is that we work very hard to make sure, and yes, there's much more to be done around how the impact of that support is felt right across the geography of Scotland for, for all of the people of Scotland. Um, we know what the uh, local government uh, uh, landscape looks like, I've talked about that, and also what the breakdown of our kind of support looks like against that in terms of direct spend. But um, we should also recognise that many of the things that we do support in certain geographic locations goes on to tour or be um, distributed right across the other parts of Scotland. So it's, it's, it's only one lens to look at individual local authority spend per, uh, spend in local authorities per se. But, um, you know, for example, the, re the regular funded organisations, the predominance of the base locations of those organisations is Edinburgh, Glasgow, but we've got 21 local authorities represented there. But we know that 75% or so of the work of all of those 121 organisations is actually across all of the geography of Scotland. So, you know, I think I think it's important that we keep um, working hard at that. But there's n no doubt that there is an absolute tension there in terms of available resource against um, the ability to uh, to respond. But we work very hard with the, the resource that we've got to make sure that there is, there is distribution there. I uh, th th thank you, and I commend you for that, that good work. Um, and my final point really is around the Wavehill uh, report, which we were uh, given. In the summary, it says that the evaluation team uh, highlighted several differences of opinion between the leadership team and the board uh, within your organisation. It says that this points to deterioration in the relationship between the two bodies. It then later talks about ambiguity and a lack of transparency at the heart of the criticism directed towards your organisation. How will you as an organisation respond to those criticisms and what changes will you make? I appreciate resource changes, I new people, uh, the chair and the chief executive may alter and affect the direction of travel, but clearly this isn't a one-off, this is a systemic problem that's been identified in terms of the relationship between your board and the day-to-day -day management of your organisation. What are you doing to fix that? So I think it's fair to say that things have moved on already. I think we're in a different environment with different leadership, um, including myself, of course, um, and the new chair and increasing um, change within the board over, over time too. Um, I think it was taking place in a very particularly hot environment, that, and I think that added to some of those tensions that... Uh, uh, were in play. I think everybody was doing their absolute best to navigate that and 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 find ways of uh, of ways ways through. But undoubtedly, there were there were clear tensions there. And one of the learning points that I referenced earlier on is about making sure that in in all of this in. Uh, the organisation going forward, that there's a clear understanding about the relative roles and responsibilities, who's doing what, how and when, in any process that we run or any key policy or strategy decisions that we make. So I feel we're already in a much better place. Um, other people tell me that too. Um, uh, and you, you, you can get a sense of that but uh, uh, from others, but uh, we'll continue to work at that. I mean, I think it's fundamentally important that the governance of the organisation uh, works effectively um, and that we support the organisation at board and non-exec, uh, sorry, and exec level to be able to ensure that these issues are understood and, and never repeated. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ross Greer, did you have a quick supplement? Yes, thank you, Camino. Um, it's two questions, so I'll ask them uh, together because they're on the one uh, issue and I'll try to be brief. Going back to uh, the studio and build space section of the business plan, the only target and KPI in there are for the Leith Dock development, but I know that uh, your ambition is for more than just that. So the first question is, uh, why is that the only target and KPI in the business plan when Screen Scotland has greater ambition to expand infrastructure. Uh, and the second question related to that is, we've seen press reports about the significant Lord of the Rings production that would potentially come to Leith Dock uh, if it is uh, operational by this autumn. If it is not operational by the autumn, is there a risk that that production goes elsewhere? Um, I can't comment on, I'm afraid, on any, um, any, any given production before it's, um, you know, it's something that we, um, 
can talk about in public, so I can't comment on any individual production, as I say. Um, we're very, very acutely aware of a number of productions that um, would love to use the facility, so getting it open as soon as possible, as soon as feasible, um, is, is an absolute priority. Um, I think the reason why you see this as the key performance indicator in the studio build space is because um, it's key performance indicator, and this is a two-year plan that ends um, in um, at the end of the financial year 2020. So um, we have a range of other performance indicators beneath that, but you know that, that we'll be measuring. But this is the very top line um, KPIs that we're, we're setting here in the short period of time that this plan lasts for. So I think you'll see more of that. And in fact, I suppose it's that also the range of bill space that that's that's ongoing work. You know, in order to promote the other the other work and our ability to. Um, uh, stimulate, you know, directly come on board and stimulate proactive new space is um, is sequential in, in, in a way, and um, we can support other other projects that are in the in the private domain as I've as I've outlined. But um, I think it's it, it's really worth getting this one open and seeing where that takes us. Um, in addition to the work that we do to support the build space around the Scotland. Thanks. The expanding studio capacity was obviously a major priority of the committee in our report, so I imagine mm -hmm. we'll write to yourselves to ask for the further detail on the, the indicators that you've said are, are okay. sitting beneath that. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks very much. And could I just, if, if I may, I know that we're slightly over time, but I'll just get another couple of quick questions uh, from myself um, just as we wind up. Um, you, you talked earlier um, both to um, Jamie Green and to Kenneth Gibson about um, in incentives um, for uh, filmmakers uh, to come here and to place work here. Um, I just wanted to kind of maybe drill down on that, the carrot and the stick approach. You talked about the, the carrot approach. Um, when we speak to um, uh, producers in the screen sector who work in Canada or France, they are under, ve because they're getting money from Canada and France, they are um, they're under quite very strict conditions as to um, employing Canadian and French talent. And uh, I know they think, think of one that spent a lot of time in the Eurotunnel because the post-production had to be done in France and another case where a Canadian writer had to be used. H have you got any plans to, uh, to review um, the, the, the way that you provide incentives to ensure that we take, um, in terms of the stick approach, <laughs> um, that people have to, have to um, uh, use Scottish talent uh, in order to get the, the funds that are available? Um, yes, I mean, I think Canada and France actually are both very strong co-producing nations, and I think that the, 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 the restrictions that you refer to will be to do with the spend requirements within co-production treaties, and Scotland's part of that same network of co-production treaties, so Scotland's crew will benefit from those same rules where there is a need for Scotland's filmmaking contribution to be at a particular percentage in line with its financial contributions. So, so that tends to be how things work. If France is putting in 60% of the budget, 60% of the um, budget uh, will need to be represented by people, goods and services from France, and that's also true for Scotland. Um, so that's part of that framework. Um, we do, I think, across all of our um, production funds, require the use of Scottish personnel. So whether that is through the Film and Development Production Fund, which is absolutely anchored around um, Scottish com uh, production companies that are resident in Scotland, the a priority going to um, Scottish film makers, who will, of course, want to work with, with local crew as well. And there, th th there's a very strong spend requirement around, around that fund too. Um, likewise, with the Broadcast Content Fund, that's very much predicated upon um, the use of Scottish companies who are using local personnel as well. We have another mechanism there on the TV side, of course, with the Ofcom regulations. So um, I think there is a balance to be struck between a, um, uh, you know, a hard and fast approach that doesn't allow um, companies the flexibility and the creativity to use uh, non-Scottish personnel where it suits the creative needs of the production. Um, that is something that is being made very clear to me by um, not only Scottish companies, but companies that want to come and work in Scotland where there are either existing relationships or there are projects that have been gestating for a long time in development where it wouldn't be in Scotland's interest to be overly dogmatic about, you know, kicking off a particular writer. You know, we, we you know, yeah. Yeah. Woman, and obviously mm -hmm. there's obviously got to be that, that yeah. flexibility. Uh -huh. But are you saying that, you know, like um, that we are as tough as Canada and France? Because whenever I speak to people mm -hmm. in the industry, they tell me that Canada and France are extremely tough um, when it comes to ensuring that 
their talents employed and money is spent in their country? I would say that we are. I mean, I think that France and Canada, in my experience, are both economies that rely very heavily on co-production and, and, and actually enforce their co-production rules uh, very, very strongly. I think Canada comes at the whole um, growth piece from a very industrial perspective. So um, that's, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses to that system, I would say. Um, France um, uh, is, is very much predicated around language as well. So there are, there are other, you know, they, they, they've made their industries in their own image, I think. And I think what we need to do in Scotland is to make sure that we, yes, we're, we're, we're tough, we're asking all the right questions. I think the fact that we, um, other than the UK tax credit, um, have, there's, there's a human dimension to all of the selection processes. And, and in the case of the Production Growth Fund, which is key intervention for incoming production, um, you, you know, we are scrutinising very, very carefully all of the applications. And happily, you know, given, given the, the booming market, we're in a position to be very, very strong about those requirements um, to make sure yeah. that Scottish... So do you think... Sorry that. to interrupt. So mm -hmm. do you think... You, you, you've already said you think your requirements are tough, but in yeah. terms of the enforcement... Mm -hmm. I mean, in, you mentioned in terms of the Out of London mm -hmm. with Ofcom, we've yes. had conversations about Ofcom about yes. this, and obviously Ofcom are doing their own work on that. Um, do, would you be reviewing how you monitor these things? Because I think it's fair to say that the committee in its scrutiny of Ofcom wasn't absolutely convinced that the sufficient monitoring was in place mm -hmm. to absolutely make sure that the, um, the requirements were being met by companies that were yeah. uh, supposed to be Got doing it. more work in Scotland. Got it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when, when Ofcom last gave evidence, but, but my sense from the last couple of months is that things are really moving in that space towards yeah. uh, much stronger monitoring and enforcement in, yeah. in the TV and space. And what about in terms of your, your direct uh, yeah. grants and incentives? Are you going to improve monitoring there? Um, well, we, we, you know, through setting these KPIs, it's something that absolutely we're measuring, and through the enhanced resource that we have at Screen Scotland on the research and monitoring side, then yes, it's absolutely something that, that we're looking at. Um, we'll be doing it anyway as part of the spend um, uh, spend measurements uh, and the work in that field. But but yes, absolutely, we are we are. Um, you know, we look not only at the point of application and awarding of the money, but but through production as to to how that's how how our money has benefited the Scottish industry at okay. the other end of the process. Thank you very much. And Thank one you. just last question to Ian Monroe. Again, going back, I think it was to your exchange earlier um, with um, uh, it was actually Ale Alexander when you were talking to Alexander and you, about the creative industries, and uh, you 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 were being very polite, but you you talked about how the creative industries was your remit. But I felt that reading between the lines, you you, you did feel that. Um, uh, you didn't have the budget um, that went with that remit, and that's something that's come up time and time again in this committee's scrutiny uh, of um, the creative industries and in previous committees' scrutinies of the cre creative industries. And you talked about, you know, the, the partnership with SE and putting quite a lot of time and effort into that partnership. Would you prefer to see some of that budget being blunt about it? Should some of the creative industries budget come from SE and be transferred into your budget so that you can get up to the 0.5% that you said was um, desirable? So, I, I mean, we, we are absolutely ambitious for the creative industries. I do recognise that we are inhibited in terms of the resources, as you've said. I'm not going to play, make a play, because I wouldn't like it done against my organisation, um, for any other organisation's <laughs> resources directly in, in, in this kind of forum. What I would say is that we feel inhibited in being able to deliver against that creative industry's beef to, uh, brief to the full extent that we would want to, and that I think is expected of us when it's so reliant on partnership working as opposed to yeah. directly within a, a kind of an empowered position within Creative Scotland per se itself. So um, whether it's one organisation or multiple organisations um, in order to generate the actual source of the, the investment, if it's directly placed within Creative Scotland, that's a very much more empowered uh, position to enable us to deliver on the brief, as I say, that's mm -hmm. expected of us. But you mentioned SE's um, strategic review. I mean, are you pressing as part of that strategic review for the budget, more of the budget allocation to be coming over to so you? So they're, they're, they're very positive conversations with Steve Dunlop um, at Scottish Enterprise about the principle of if we can identify mutual set of priorities then there, there is the opportunity, and actually, you know, in theory, it, it's both ways. 
um, to identify um, human and fin financial resource that should be attached to that, that's in our kind of mutual endeavour to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that we would always want to be continuing that endeavour with any partner anyway in terms of unlocking opportunities and resources. But it's secondary to what is more ideal, which is direct investment through Creative Scotland in a more empowered position that means that um, the energy and focus is spent on making things happen as opposed to, in part, unlocking the potential of that partnership, which can be often protracted discussions mm. to achieve. Okay, I think we will be returning to that subject. Uh, but thank you very much to both of you for coming to give evidence today. And we shall now move into private session. <laughs>